Hello, this is Digital Accessibility, the people behind the progress. I'm Joe Walensky, the creator and host of this series. And uh, as an accessibility professional myself, I find it very interesting as to how others have found their way into this profession. So let's meet one of those people right now and hear about their journey. All right. Well, here we go with another episode where I have the great opportunity to speak with an accessibility practitioner. And today I'm pleased to be talking with Leonie Watson. Hello, Leonie. How are you today? Hey, Joe. I'm very well. Hope you are too. I'm good. And I'm uh, at my home office on Vashon Island, which is near Blink's Seattle headquarters. Where are you talking to us from? Uh, I'm in Bristol, a uh, city to the west of London in the UK. Oh, all right. I've been to Bristol. It's a lovely place to visit. <laughs> it is. And I'm um, happy to have you here on the program. I, I, I've been familiar with uh, you and your work for for a long time as, as you're, uh, you're uh, quite uh, available in 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 posts on online media and uh, the other elements of your work. But for those who may not have uh, been as lucky as myself, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, your current position and the type of work that you're involved with? Sure. So at the moment, I am uh, co-directing a company called Tetralogical. We started it uh, almost exactly four years ago this month. Uh, we're a small company. And we're working obviously in accessibility. You'll never find me too far away from, from this particular part of our industry. But rather than doing the typical thing that a lot of accessibility companies do and focusing exclusively on auditing and those kind of things, um, we take a more extempore approach, if you like, to accessibility. So everything for us begins with a conversation with the organizations that come to us and want to work with us. And pretty much anything can come out of that conversation, which is absolutely what we we hoped would happen when we started the company. And it means we we have some very long, enduring relationships with, with clients, lots of it focused around the idea that we have for sustainable accessibility. You know, you and I will both know that there's only so much that any one individual, any one team, any one organization can do to change accessibility. We've got to get more people on board, got to get more people doing this for themselves. We've got to, you know, to coin a very popular phrase at the moment, make people more self-sufficient when it comes to accessibility. And, and so we've ended up working on you know, all sorts of interesting projects from kind of biometrics, um, artificial intelligence, through as well, you know, websites, apps, and all the kind of more garden variety things. So uh, I guess the short answer to your question is I've been having a lot of fun for the last couple of years. Well, it sounds like uh, there's uh, it's a lot of action packed uh, uh, activities there, but uh, maybe if you could talk a little bit about what, uh, you know, a day in the life or a, uh, you know, a week in the life is uh, for uh, your organization and the type and the type of work that you do. Uh, sure, it's probably better if I do talk about the organization, because uh, a lot of my time is spent with kind of sales and administration and invoicing and all those wonderful things that are necessary about running a small business. But I do get to do you know, a lot of the consultancy work that, that we deliver. But, um, you know, we're working with a wide range of, of organizations at the moment um, across a lot of sectors as well, which is is really nice. And I think it's one of the nice things about being in, in you know, our sort of part of the business is what we do has a kind of sort of regularity to it but the organizations that we work with change all the time and you get to learn something about different parts of what other people do so you know we're working with retailers with publishers um with financial uh institutions broadcasting companies um uh you know and, and government to some extent too as well so uh, we we get to mix it up with a lot of different organizations um as i said a lot of what we do is around the idea of sustainable accessibility. So those are, are long-term engagements where we pretty much help organizations do whatever it is they need to get done. Uh, it could mean policies, it could mean processes, it could mean training, it could be one-to-one -one mentoring, uh, it could be kind of iterative design reviews, code reviews, helping set up champions networks. Um, you know, two of my team, actually three now as of this month, are ex-BBC uh, accessibility team members and of course, Gareth Ford Williams at the BBC was really the uh, 
the, the grandfather, though he won't thank me for calling him that, you know, of the Champions Network and, and the BBC Network, you know, remains one of the, the best known, I think, you know, um, out there within the community. So, you know, that forms a big part of it. In short, you know, we'll turn our hands to to anything we think we've got the, the knowledge and the expertise to help with that helps the organisation in question kind of get where they need to go. We do do a bunch of assessments too. No accessibility company would be entirely without those, no matter how much we might like to be. Uh, but we also, you know, do a, a lot of training, um, mostly training at scale, self-led training, which has really been nice because it's been a chance to expand our kind of creative thinking a little bit. Uh, many of the team, like myself, are really used to talking to people, doing podcasts, um, conference talks, you know, writing those kind of things. But but shifting that into self-led online training, but keeping up the kind of creativity, the engagement, the interactivity. Uh, that was an interesting, you know, interesting few months to go through. And, and indeed, you know, I think we're still learning about that from, from people as we, we learn more about instructional design and, you know, things like that. So, yeah, lots of different activities. I don't know that there is a kind of typical week and, and that's really nice, actually. I hope it, it doesn't ever really become too typical because uh, it's fun when we get challenged to do new things or, or things in a different way. Well, it's uh, great to hear about all the comprehensive comprehensive activities that you uh, have going on at your organization. Uh, one of the re regular themes that uh, I have in this series is to you know, learn about how people found their way to where they are uh, today in terms of lived life and work life, uh, first exposures to uh, accessibility and accessibility technologies, and then that the decision uh, or evolution uh, where that becomes part of your profession. So uh, maybe take us back in time and, and uh, mm -hmm. let us know how, uh, you know, it, it, it began and evolved for you. Uh, I can. You know, the ultra quick answer to that uh, particular question is by accident. That's how I got into to all of this. Um, I have to think right back though, the mid nineties, uh, I was working as a, uh, what we used to call a web designer back then, uh, back in the days when that person used to do the, the creative design, the coding, um, user experience, you know, was known and understood, but it hadn't really become part of the, the web sort of ethos at that point so much. Um, uh, and I was doing that for one of the first internet service providers here in the UK. Uh, I lost my sight in, in the year from late 99 to 2000. And while I was sort of going through a couple of years of, of putting my life back together and, you know, figuring out how to cross the road, choose the right clothes, do my grocery shopping, uh, I started to to relearn how to use a computer. And of course, with a screen reader this time, you know, for, for your listeners who might not be familiar, that software that simply speaking, translates what most people see on screen into, in my case, synthetic speech that I can listen to. And uh, I had joined a couple of forums to figure out, you know, how to use this screen reader thing. And it was all a bit complicated and a bit peculiar. And I spotted an email from uh, someone called Alistair Campbell. And the email said, we're working for a, a startup uh, user experience agency. Uh, and we've just built our first website for our, our, our first client. And we understand the importance of accessibility and so do they, but they're a, a small educational institution and they don't have the budget to do usability testing, especially not with people with disabilities. If any of the screen reader users on this list could spare a few minutes to take a look around and, and give us some feedback, we'd be very grateful. And I remember thinking, well, I used to be a web designer, so I guess I know something about what they've they've actually just designed and built, and I'm definitely now a screen reader user, so sure, why not? Uh, Alistair Campbell, if the name isn't familiar to you, is, is one of the founders and directors of a very well-renowned uh, user experience agency in Bristol here called Nomensa. Alistair's actually now co-chair of the working group that's responsible for the web content accessibility guidelines at the W3C. Uh, but we got talking and uh, discovered that actually Nomensa was very close to, to where I was living at the time, uh, I started doing a little bit of contract work for them and discovered really that accessibility, you know, was a kind of thing. And it really challenged my my like for code, um, uh, my love for puzzles. I like solving puzzles. I like trying to figure out why stuff doesn't work. And as I've said, you know, many times before, putting it back together in ways that do work. And I guess I just got the bug through through Alistair and the others at, at the team at Nomensa then. And it was you know, a tiny company. And I think I was 
first, second employee, maybe something like that. And so it just really went from there. Right? I just discovered, yeah, loved it, fascinated by it. And the more I learned, the more I liked. And yeah, everything pretty much leading up to the here and now kind of can be traced back through those few steps, I guess. Well, I, you know, at, at that time where you were, uh, you, you know, thanks for sharing your your personal experiences with with that and with with working with screen reader and uh, assistive technologies have have always been so important uh, in the development of accessibility. But for for you at the time, uh, so here you are, uh, you know, trying to find tools and understand tools that would uh, you know make it. Uh, possible for you to continue to do the work that you you loved uh uh and at the same time you're trying to craft solutions uh related to accessibility so you know what you know what was that all like in in it you know in the time in terms of uh you know finding tools and technologies and then being able to use that to help uh organizations have more accessible solutions well, learning to use a screen reader was mayhem for quite a long time. I, I, I won't tell you otherwise. Uh, actually, a, a friend of mine had a genius suggestion. Um, they suggested I, I study for an online course, uh, partly because I was getting really bored stuck at home before I figured out how to, you know, move around safely with my white cane and such. And partly because, you know, I, I wanted to, to learn more about, you know, if I could go back to work in some capacity. Uh, so I ended up doing an online course called You, Your Computer and the Internet. Uh, content wise, you know, of course, it was stuff that I'd been quite familiar with for, for several years already at this point. But it gave me a structured way to make myself relearn how to do all those things with a screen reader. You know, and I, I remember very clearly the very first day of my course, it took me a good couple of hours to log in because I just didn't understand how, you know, how to use a form you know, and to type as opposed to using keys to navigate around. And, but it did the job. I, I eventually got through it and, you know, slowly but surely figured out how to, to use a screen reader. So having got through that particular pickle, uh, yeah, the, the, the working was nice because it did give me a chance to, to keep my hand in, you know, looking at code, understanding it, even writing fragments of it. Although, you know, I, was, I wasn't able to then and, and have never yet found a way really, um, you know, for a blind person to be able to handle things like you know the visual design the, the css part of coding um, but it was enough to, to keep me kind of occupied and interested uh, and as you say you know then sort of finding solutions uh, retrospectively if i look back now you know 20 or more years ago the websites we were dealing with were an awful lot more simple than they are now you know, people put together mostly flat HTML with a bit of JavaScript. You know, this was even before the days of, of the so-called web 2.0, the Ajax era, um, you know, so JavaScript might be used for a few rollover menus for visual effects or to kind of, you know, change up the, the underlines on, on links and things like that, but not much more than that. Uh, you know, so the problems we were dealing with, they didn't seem it at the time, but if I look back now, they were yeah, much more simple than you know, the more complex kind of, JavaScript frameworks, you know, the, the more entangled, you know, uh, stacks that developers and designers kind of work with these days. But it was fun. It, it was just something like genuinely enjoyed doing at the time. And, and thankfully, so far, at least, I've never really lost that particular enjoyment. Well, you've uh, had such a uh, such a long uh, ex set of experiences, specifically in the consulting area, you've probably seen just about uh, every kind of uh, situation uh, that's possible out there. But, uh, you know, just uh, with the breadth of your experiences, uh, you know, what are some of the things that you've seen where uh, like priorities have changed or things have gotten better or maybe not so much in terms of the, the types of things that you're being confronted with? I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, in the early days, uh, a lot of basic technologies were a big part of it. Uh, there's probably some new challenges today. So uh, you kind of maybe pick anything in there uh, to kind of let us know how you see things uh, have evolved uh, in your time. I think they have changed. Um, and I think in some respects, we, we just exchange one set of problems for another. And that sounds terribly negative. But I think that's just an inevitability of, of technology as much as anything else. 
uh, you know, back around the, the early mid 2000s, you know, we had, uh, this was still the era when people were using tables for layout, for example, you know, so, so using an HTML construct that was never intended to control visual layout, but actually did it remarkably well, unless you happen to be a person who had a need for a bit more flexibility in the way things were ordered or arranged or, you know, made to expand or contract, for example. So, you know, back then that was definitely one of the big and, and constant challenges we came across. Now, of course, we almost never see tables used for layout. Thankfully, there was a huge campaign in, to, to move people away from that particular course of action, but we've exchanged it for, for other problems. Uh, I mentioned JavaScript frameworks earlier, and they're often the, uh, you know, the, the whipping boy of, of accessibility people. I'm enough of a pragmatist to recognize their value, you know, in terms of production teams. They do allow for rapid iteration, rapid production. Um, they do save people from having to rewrite code that's been written umpteen times before, but they do and have abstracted developers from understanding the value and the importance of what these frameworks you know put out at the end what they render at the end and so i think we're moving away from a time when if you worked in web development if you coded websites you know because you handcrafted it or even if you used you know an ade or, or some kind of editor to do it you still really understood you know what all the elements were for and, and kind of what their purposes were about um we really sort of lost that kind of art of understanding html and how it works and along with it, of course, we're we're seeing more and more problems with regards to semantics. My screen reader, like all others, of course, is entirely dependent on the HTML for the, for the information I get to discover about a web page, whether something's a heading, a link, or you know whatever. And so I think we're we, yeah we're losing that kind of understanding. So it's a shame, but you know, like tables that that weren't used for layout originally, then were then you know now or not again I, i'm reasonably optimistic that the pendulum will will swing back again um performance interestingly is is proving to be an effective ally for accessibility the more people are looking at performance and realizing that using a lot of these frameworks and the amount of javascript that's being piled onto websites is not a good idea they're kind of pulling back to simpler solutions that actually are a good compromise between that kind of rapid iteration the reusability of code um, but with you know stronger HTML, better semantics, because, you know, that can be done with much better performance results as a rule and just, you know, throwing JavaScript rendered code at everything all the time. So yeah, problems have, problems have changed. Some stay the same, you know, we still have trouble with keyboard accessibility. We always have done form labels, things like that um, don't seem to have, you know, changed much. But the one thing I think perhaps more importantly than anything that has changed is attitude and awareness. When I first started in accessibility, I seem to spend most of my time explaining to people that accessibility existed, uh, what it was. Um, then for, for a few years in the middle, it, it kind of became really about making the case for it, why it's important, who it benefits. Lately, you know, the past few years, the conversation seems to have turned much more to, okay, yeah, I get all that. How do I actually do this? What are the practicalities? What do I need to do tomorrow, next week, next month, next year to do it? And I think, you know, that... Coupled with the fact that a lot of the conferences I speak at are, quote, mainstream, unquote, development or design or UX conferences. And it's rare now for those conferences not to include at least one accessibility talk. Go back about 10 years or so, pretty much the only place you ever got accessibility talks was at accessibility conferences. And we were kind of, you know, singing to each other, if you like. Uh, I think that's changed massively now. There's there's much more interest from, from the whole community out there in the topic. And that's, for me, is as I say, you know, possibly the most important, certainly the happiest change that I've seen over the time. Well, I, yeah, I, I would agree with uh, that in, in terms of the user experience uh, area where uh, you know, I spend most of my time. It, you know, definitely uh, has been a visible increase in attention to accessibility and, and at UX events to, you know, to have uh, talks about that. So I, I, I agree. I've definitely seen that evolve. Um, and as you kind of look forward, uh, your current activities uh, moving into the future, are there uh, any new uh, challenges that you're excited about or, or things that uh, uh, you might be concerned about uh, moving forward in the next few years? I 
so one area that really excites me at the moment that I think is you know really going to to continue to grow and change is, is voice interfaces we've seen such a huge rise in those pretty much every platform that you've got in your pocket on your desk sitting on your bookshelf you know can talk to you in some capacity or another and in many cases you can talk back at them as well you know, for someone like me who's who's been listening to my technology for the past 20 odd years uh, I find the lack of knowledge actually about voice design <laughs> and voice interface design from from the community at large now you know lots of people are doing it you know quite amusing in a, in a slightly ghastly kind of way um, but there's so much huge potential out there and it's it's really not being used to the extent it could be you know, echo devices you know, google home google assistant devices they've got a huge capacity to be made to speak in different voices with different accents, you know, in different ways and shapes and forms, and it's massively underutilized. But but when you really think about it, you know, choosing a voice as part of your brand, for example, uh, as well as choosing, you know, the words and phrases that these things speak back to you, uh, you get into a whole kind of realm of, of yeah unexplored possibilities. So I've been having a lot of fun with that in recent years, and I think there's there's plenty more of that to come. The one area I'm really interested in that actually still gives me a degree of concern is uh, XR, you know, augmented virtual reality inside or outside of the browser. At the moment, by and large, it is still a very visual um, medium. And uh, I'm envious, to be perfectly honest with you. I think for the first time since I lost my sight, I have found myself thinking, damn it, that's the thing I really want to experience. And right now, just just can't. I do hope that that like you know touch screens before it when everybody shrieked and there's no way you're going to be able to make a touch screen device accessible to a blind person and you know, Apple of course managed to do exactly that. I do hope you know that that somebody somewhere will will have the same thing moment with uh, you know VR and and AR and and find a way to do it. Um, something actually one of my team has been exploring uh, in a great deal, looking at how do we make augmented reality accessible to to different groups. So I'm optimistic, but yeah, like I said, just really envious because I want to play and I can't right now. <laughs> yeah, of, co of course, an important part of that is is that uh, that our field of uh, user experience, especially in the area of of design, is is made open for uh, people with physical challenges to participate as, as equitable designers to provide us with insights on those unique experiences. And for example, just the one you were just using, uh, you know, for myself as a, as a sighted person, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I would not be the best person to understand how to, uh, create an environment that would be uh, entertaining and engaging for you. But I, I think in terms of tools and business processes, we, we have a long way to go as a field to have, uh, you know, to be equitable in that area. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but, you know, the good thing is, is that there are, it seems, always people out there up for the challenge. Uh, I wish sometimes those people got involved a little earlier in, in, in the whole thing. Uh, maybe one day that will start to happen more regularly. But, you know, if I look back, you know, the, the, the inventiveness of people never fails to amaze me. You know, somebody came up with the idea of a screen reader. Um, you know, Rich Hortefeger was one of the most important people in that. Um, uh, you know, Hunter from Hunter and Joyce, you know, all the team now at Freedom Scientific, you know, how did that, how did that come about? That's that's an incredible bit of inventive technology. You know, technology itself is incredibly inventive. How did somebody decide that you know, pointing a mouse and rolling it around should control something on a screen? You know, if you think about it now, it just seems so everyday. But back then, it must have been you know, like magic. Uh, and uh, you know, I say touch screens. Everybody thought they were going to be a showstopper, certainly for blind people. Of course, they still can be problematic for people with some physical disabilities, but you know we've overcome. We we've come up with solutions, workarounds, you know, theories like that. So yeah, I am an optimist. In case that hasn't already become apparent, and there are a lot of really smart people out there in the world. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm I hope we we will figure these things out. Well, uh, I I think uh, 
that's a kind of great uh, optimistic uh, way to, to end things here. It, it's certainly <laughs> been a pleasure to uh, have this opportunity to uh, chat with you and, uh, you know, hopefully, you, you know, we'll be able to uh, meet each other sometime at a physical event. <laughs> That'll be nice. But thanks so much. Take care. Thank you, Jeff. It's been a pleasure.